Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Zaki. So why I'm a storyteller now is because I grasp what a story can do for people. The, the story literally saved my life. And because of the story, I have a fire burning in me now. That is why I'm so committed to what I do as an artist. Hello and welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. On this week's episode, we have Christopher Lamb, who is an actor and model. Please enjoy this episode. Uh, welcome to the Creative Lotus Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. So Christopher, I like to kick off everything, just jumping right on in. What is your background? Kind of where were you born and raised? And kind of what was your childhood like? Uh, and then ultimately kind of from that, what ultimately brought you here to LA, which are, is where you're at now? Uh, but yeah, take your time, kind of share uh, your story and your history, because uh, yeah, love to know some more. Of course. Um, so I am originally from Germany. I was born and raised there. My whole family's there. I'm the only one that came to America. I've been in America since 2012 now. I celebrated 10 years last year. I was raised in a very small town of like 250 people in in the forest in Germany. It was a very much Brothers Grimm. I would trade my... We had. I grew up on a farm. I, tra- I trade my, my grandmother's eggs at the baker in the morning for bread. So it was like living my... Little Red Riding Hood fantasy. Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up in Germany. Um, um, I went to culinary arts school. I graduated yeah. from a German high school and from an American high school in Germany. So I had both diplomas. And then mm-hmm. I ended up joining the U.S. Air Force, mm-hmm. where I was an electronic warfare technician for cargo aircrafts. I also did honor guard. On the weekend, which is where you do the flag pulling ceremony for any any military member that had passed mm. away, and I was also right. a sexual assault victims advocate. Um, so I was certified to kind of mediate in between s- sexual assault survivors and um, the police or the the court system, and kind of like be there to help them through the process of uh-huh. healing and also um, filing a report. And then I got out of the military when I was 20. I was, I just, I was 18 when I joined. So I I did it for like two and a half years. I got out right before, like a a few weeks before I turned 21 Mm -hmm. and then moved to LA. I realized I, I've always wanted to be a storyteller, but being in the closet growing up in Germany, that was a part of me that I fully pushed away and denied. I played 11 years of soccer instead of doing theater being scared wow. that I was going to get outed if I did, you know, in Germany, in like a village of 250 people, if you're, if you're doing theater, you know, you're quit. <laughs> it, screams, it, screams, it screams I'm out, you know, in, in America, I feel like theater is a little more inclusive, but in Germany where everything's very serious and strict and focused, it's, it's not, not, not like that. Got it. Wow. No, that's you amazing. You didn't ask any question. That was kind of like my cliff notes. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I mean, yeah, that's kind of a very like varied past, if you will, or childhood and kind of like coming to the States and going to the military and helping with like grief counseling and all of these things, um, which, you know, I know we've talked kind of offline about this, but I'm curious kind of how how did the process from going from Germany, coming to the States, also coming out, uh, kind of lead you down the road of acting, uh, right? Which is what your main focus is now. Um, but then, um, you know, I actually first came across, I think your work when as a model first and foremost, cause I, um, you know, obviously a photographer and see, you know, model boards and stuff, but, um, yeah, just kind of, if you can give us some background on how you got into that once you came here, especially, you know, going from being in the military to, or air force rather, uh, to, you know, because becoming a model and an actor. Yeah, mo- modeling was, so my, my goal was acting, but my German accent, excuse me, was still very thick. So modeling was kind of my foot in the door of being in the industry and getting mm. comfortable on sets and just kind of like, you know, like slowly walking into the waters of a, a storyteller. I'll dig into my childhood and the, the, the more, the more not so fun stuff, because that's, that's where, where my artistry comes from, where I start, um, I I caught my dad cheating on my mom when I was twelve, wow. and um, we kind of we have a good relationship now. But we kind of we were blackmailing each other. I start he would give me cigarettes, oh 
vodka so that I wouldn't tell her, um, which wow. which I bought into. And then a year later, I did detective work and I found out the other woman's phone number, name and address and wow. basically told my mom, this is what's going on. And we dealt with that. My sister and I, I'm very open about this too. I know you know about this, but we were both sexually abused by my uncle when I was eight turning nine and she was, she was seven years old at the time. And it happened over a two week period of time. He was 27. My dad was deployed in Afghanistan. My mom was pregnant with my younger brother. So she dropped us off at my dad's parents' place where he, he was a meth addict living in the attic and my grandparents were old. So he would basically take care of us and play with us and take us to get ice cream and to the zoo. Um, mm. which is, was, was very painful to deal with, uh, being in the closet, yeah. dealing with the sexual abuse. Um, I didn't really remember it until I was 14 when my, yeah. my dad got a call that my uncle had passed away due to mm. some drug related, um, money borrowing situation. And then my brain felt safe to like, kind of let all these memories through. And I thought I was going crazy. Um, my sister, as a result of all of it ran away from home 13 years ago. I haven't mm. seen or talked to her in 13 years. Um, I'm hoping that one day, you know, that we'll be able to have a relationship again. But for her, the abuse manifested as schizophrenia and borderline and really sad. And then basically long story short, um, that's tying it back together. When I was 18, I was suicidal. I've, I've had like two suicide attempts by then. And then I watched this movie called The Lovely Bones, directed by Peter Jackson, which, with a phenomenal cast. The actual book was released the year of my sexual abuse, and the film came out the year that I was fully committed to taking my life. And mm -hmm. watching that movie, the, 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 basically the essence of the story shot an, an arrow of fire through my heart. Not through my heart, but basically through the fortress that it kind of grew around my heart in all these years. Um, and it basically lit, lit a candle that I, I was like harboring and like all this hope came up and basically because of the movie, it awakened something in me that yes, I went through this, but I want to transform it and mm -hmm. I want to create value from what happened. And I also want to be able to shine a light for others, but also why I'm a storyteller now is because I grasp what a story can do for people. The, the story right. literally saved my life. And because of the story, I have a fire burning in me now. That is why I'm so committed to what I do as an artist. Hmm. Yes. Wow. Well, thank you so much for yeah. sharing so openly and uh, yeah, telling us, you know, your story. Cause um, I think a lot of people can relate, you know, the, our personal traumas are kind of the, the means to either, like you said, you know, transform something or you can kind of harbor that. Right. And, and for some people, yeah, it really ends up hurting them so much that it, you know, turns into kind of a, a mental uh, illness, if you will, if you're not able to kind of treat that. So um, I'm curious, you know, at such a young age, you know, you, although everything had happened and I know you said a few years later, you kind of opened the floodgates to kind of remember these things. How were you able to kind of take that, and then, you know, go to the Air Force and then ultimately, right, come to LA and everything. Cause it seems like, did you have a process or something at that time that you were able to kind of process what you had gone through or were you see, did you have help or was it kind of like you held on to it and just tried to work through it yourself? I didn't really share about it. And in, in the military, I saw therapists and I did EMDR therapy. Um, when I watched the movie, it was kind of the catalyst for me to embark on this journey. Like uh, before that, I was not on a on a, a journey of of kind of like facing what had happened and saying I I'm gonna take the power to heal from it. Um, before that, I was very much just suffering and the effect of what had happened and um, felt very powerless and was in a very hellish state of life. Um, watching the movie was then a catalyst for me to say I don't I don't know what this journey is gonna look like, but I'm gonna take the first step. And then uh, being in the being in the military, I, I saw therapists and uh, there was one I saw, I think I saw three therapists and there's one therapist who I did EMDR therapy with who ended up going to the police with me and I filed mm -hmm. a report against um, my uncle. He, he actually ended up, so this is crazy too, my dad, when uh, the whole thing happened where we thought he was dead, he ended up not mm -hmm. being dead. Like it was a, it was someone else what? that they found that they thought my uncle, yeah, he ended up not being dead. Um, wow. So 
I, I filed a report against him when I was 20 because it, because it had been like a 10 year time period since what happened. The police couldn't really do much about it. But since 2019, he's been in jail for, I think he got arrested for committing a bunch of burglaries and they found um, child pornography on his computer. So he mm-hmm. is, he is in jail now, but I, I made the cause to, to kind of like let go, not, yeah, kind of like let go of harboring the, the pain of it and like having to forgive him, report him to the police and finally um, say, I'm, I'm going to now continue with my life and find out who I am, who I, who I am, who I always was, but behind all of what I, what I, what I had experienced, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I reported him to the police and got out of the military all within three weeks and said, oh. you know, I was like, I reported him and I said, because I was working as a victim's advocate too, this like light went off in my head. I was all like, this is my mission in this life. I was like, I've all, I've n- I never wanted to be in the military. I never, mm-hmm. you know, but being in the closet, coming out in the military, facing my, my childhood, um, in, in all its kind of like incarnations. Then I finally said, you know what I really want to do is like, I want to be a storyteller and that's what I'm going to do. So I packed my bags and I left Clovis, New Mexico, which is in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And I, I drove, I drove to LA. Wow. Yes. La La Land, the, the place of where dreams and storytelling really do live. Um, that's that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Wow. It was also story. the beginning of a whole journey. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We show up and out, things are just going to fall in place and happen. But that was just really another starting point of me still healing what I brought with me. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, no. And I think it, it takes time, right, to heal any kind of wound like that. Of and course. especially at a very young age, as you know, I'm sure the the trauma that you have kind of internalized, whether you're aware of it or not, it takes, you know, it takes work to do that, you know, the, the, yeah. to be able to kind of process it. It's a spiral of deepening and excavating and, you know, kind of like healing, healing from it on so many levels that is, is, yeah. is a, a never ending process. But of course I'm in a place now where I feel liberated and, I feel like now I, I took what was annihilative and now I can affirm life because of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was able to, you know, to like use what happened as fuel for, to become happy and to also create value. So talking about coming to LA, you know, and like you said, it's like not, not an easy city. And although we, we probably all come here very naive and think like all of our dreams are going to become true. Um, you know, what was it like coming to LA and, you know, having to, I'm guessing probably get a job or, and start to find work and, you know, getting into modeling and then also acting. Um, if you can kind of elaborate on, on that process. Yeah. So when I first came to LA, I had some savings from, my, from when I was in the military, which I've, blew through pretty quick um Mm. (laughs) and i started work i think i worked with six or seven catering companies i started working at some restaurants um i worked at a hotel you know started getting pictures together for my book um a year after being here i signed with la models um wow so that started that journey and then i started you know getting rid of my accent and started you know learning or taking classes you know i've been studying for seven or eight years now, but that was a whole nother journey too. Until two and a half years ago, I was not really studying at the place that was right for me. That was really teaching me, you know, what, what, what storytelling is and how it's really an empathic art form, which is what I connected Mm -hmm. to because there's so many places in town that kind of just want to give you a product and give you a quick solution. Um, which is, which is not what that's not being human, you know, so that's not what it's about. Wow, that's really impressive. Within a year, you had not only a portfolio, but then you got signed with a huge modeling agency like LA Models. Um, what, uh, you know, I came here in, oh God, 2000, actually, yeah, it was 2007, 2008. So right when the economy crashed and, you know, didn't really know what the hell I was doing. How did you kind of break into modeling? Had you taken photos before to kind of see someone or, or just study it and kind of took it on for yourself? You know, cause that's, I mean, every, let's be real. This is uh, maybe a little bit before social media is where it's at now when you were doing this as well. So, you know, models was, you had to be kind of taken seriously as a model to model professionally. So. Yeah, I'm curious. Okay, so before I was in the military, I was actually overweight. So when oh. I joined the military and I kind of like got into shape, I married my first boyfriend, but we got an annulment. <laughs> um, so after that, I, kind of, <laughs> okay. I was like, 
I was like, I'm out of the closet now, and like, I'm getting a revenge body. And then some of my friends were like, Oh my god, you should like, you should think about modeling or acting. And I was just like, Wow, wait a second. And I was like, You know, I was like, maybe, maybe I should think about that. So I, I actually had a friend in the military who was a photographer, um, who was uh-huh. who was like, let's just you know, like, get some clothes together and do some shoots. So I was kind of like、um, gathering some images. While I was already in the process of leaving the Air Force, and then posting those on Instagram, and then while I was in New Mexico, I had a manager from LA kind of like、mm. reach out to me that was like, "I would love to represent you if you come when you come out here," which is a whole、mm. other story too because that didn't go that well either. But that was kind of、mm. my I was you know that started with that, and then I left that manager, and then was able to sign with LA Models. Um, Got it. A year later, LA models, you know, set up, you know, for, uh, photo shoots with、um, photographers, and I did some tests, I did some paid tests, and then you know, you start going out on castings and see what sticks, see what、yeah. job you book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I was gonna make a joke and say I wish I could play、uh, Megan Trainor's body because it's like that's you just got snatched and we're like fuck it, I'm gonna become a model, <laughs> which is so good. It's like it's like fuck the military, this is too butch, this is not for me. I'm gonna go over here and become like my best self and pursue what I really want, which is amazing. So he's like body yadi yadi yadi. Okay, no, that's 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 so great. Yeah, I think that the. The process of kind of finding yourself, you know, in not only in this industry but like as a creative,、um, is kind of it's a journey. Finding you- yourself as a human again, you know, too. Like, just I think that's where it all bleeds from. You know, it's like who am I as a person? You know, what 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 I mean, what makes me happy? What can I do to also, you know,、um, not just create value for myself but the world? So, like, really, like, kind of like finding finding a mission and 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 kind of like my my meaning for this this lifetime. Yeah, that's huge. That's so profound to to find your mission and to know what you're doing and to stick to that path is definitely、uh, what I think we all seek, you know. But I also feel like, and, and help me if I'm, you know, if I'm off. But like in your early twenties or just your twenties in general, I feel like. You're just kind of like hitting every bump in the road and just don't know necessarily what to do. So you know, like for you,、yeah. you know. Was you sound like you obviously knew English and everything, but you were really kind of just trying to train your your accent to kind of transform it, if you will. But you know, what was it like, kind of coming to such a a big city and being,、um, you know, in the industry? Can you share kind of maybe some of the stories that you、uh, kind of encountered? It sounds like you had a very interesting situation with your manager, and feel free to elaborate as much or as little as you want about that. But you know, this industry is not as glamorous as it seems. Uh, and so、no. I'm sure you kind、Definitely. of exp- especially modeling、yeah. where we don't have we, we don't have a union, so like、right. there's so many people that just look at as you as like a body, you know, like it's、right. like okay, like this you're not, they don't look at you as a person, which is interesting that with my my karma of being a sexual assault victim at a young age to then、mm-hmm. seek out a profession where. It's all about like my body and what what am I, what do I look like?、Um, so so that was、right. interesting, and I definitely encountered you know some photographers that were unprofessional and I'm like what's the right word like you know like doing doing things for the wrong reason and trying to like prey on you as like as a young、right. man in in LA, which also, it happens to young women as well. And that was to the first manager I had. He was you know he was taking pictures of. Guys under sixteen, naked in his in his backyard. Like I'm not gonna say his name right now, but but and, and being very open. And I was just like, what the is this? Like, what? Where am I now? And then the very first photo shoot I had too. We we did a photo shoot. There was a, a hair and makeup person. There was a stylist. You know, it was all very professional.、Um, we got. A bunch of great shots for a book, you know, that were all kind of like clothing, and then we did some underwear shoots. And then when the hairstylist and the hair makeup person left, the photographer was like,、um, "I'm now I want to shoot you naked in my in my bedroom, and you're not going to get any of these pictures unless you do it." And、wow. me still, you know, I'm still coming to terms with my my karma and my abuse. So like I, I'm still found myself in this role, kind of like replaying this role of. The victim and kind of accepting it, and then of course, and then I I did it. I went I went into the bedroom, did the shoot naked. Thankfully, he didn't like try to touch me or anything, but still, like I felt so 
violated and right. just not okay with it. And as a result of it too, I didn't tag that photographer in any of the pictures. And then he sent me a nasty message as well. So like there, like you said, it's not, it's not that glamorous. And then yeah. also, and then there's been times too, where things like that happen. And I tell my agents and I don't get a response from that email. And then you're like, okay, so like this thing happened, I'm trying to vocalize it and I'm not being heard or seen, you know, which is like kind of like a re-traumatizing of what I went through as a child. My first boyfriend that I was dating too, he, and he was um, a secret meth addict and I didn't know about that. So seven months into the relationship, I find out that he is using, you know, meth and then we still stayed together for another seven, eight months and I was trying to get him help and taking him to meetings mm -hmm. and being supportive. And then it's like, here I am. And then he became physically abusive. And I was like, here I am again, taking on this role. And like, and I, I couldn't even see it, you know? And I was, I was just kind of like, I was drawn to it and doing it. And then, mm -hmm. but that relationship was what woke up in me where I realized, oh my God, I'm dating my uncle, which was wow. such a inner cringe. It was such a cringy moment where I realized that. Right. And then after that, I was, I was single for four years because I had that realization and then was like, I need to learn what love really is not what I was kind of like the beliefs that woke up in me as a young, you know, boy based on what had happened to me, which were inaccurate. So I went on this whole journey of like, why am I here in town? I'm like, I'm here because the story saved my life and that's what I want to do. And mm. because I want, I want, I, I really want to come back home to who I am. Yeah. So that, so when, when I, when I split up with that particular ex, got rid of that manager, then had some, you know, shady photographer experiences that like, it, it kind of like rattled me in a, in a great way because it really woke me up to like seeing um, these patterns and these tendencies and these choices that I was making based mm -hmm. on, you know, something horrible that happened to me. And I was agree I was basically agreeing with it by still playing that role. So then mm -hmm. I went on a four year journey of, of being single, pretty much celibate for four years um, because I was just like really trying to um, learn to love myself and like learn to love my company and like learn to just focus on why I'm here in town and focus on having good friendships. Not the, that's another tricky thing when you move to LA at a young age is like kind of like getting involved with the wrong crowd. Um, right. So that was kind of my path then was like, I was like, I really want to make, I really want to become conscious of my unconscious and may and and really transform these stories that i've been telling myself and not realizing that i was telling myself right wow yeah you literally are like breaking the karma or this karmic you know tendency right to be able to completely transform your life and yeah i think that the the sooner we're able to do that and not kind of repeat it right the the faster you know the sense of our own happiness and kind of the purpose you know why what we're doing uh is there so yeah thank you so much for opening up uh so much about that and i think it's something that you know as a photographer myself and other friends who are in the industry as well and people i've spoken to on the podcast it's kind of like there is this very like under dark underside or undertone, if you will, to our industry. And although the Me Too movement and, uh, you know, kind of an awakening of photographers who are, you know, top tier photographers kind of, you know, open the floodgates to also kind of like stopping that, it's still, you know, very prevalent, unfortunately. The fact that you were able to kind of recognize that and then take the time to kind of do the the inner work or your the work for yourself um you know to kind of find self-love i think is it's so critical so you've kind of answered all my first questions so thank you so much without even having to ask them um but you know this podcast as i say on every episode is really based on the buddhist concept of the lotus flower or renge which represents you know the idea of cause and effect or the simultaneity of cause and effect i should say um but i like to ask you know from everything that you've just shared the trauma, the struggles, the uh, frustrations, or kind of the muck and the shit underneath the water uh, that ultimately kind of leads right this this lotus flower to bloom so beautifully. So I like to ask, kind of, you know, what struggles do you feel like you have had to go through that ultimately led you to feel like you know this beautiful lotus of a life? Yeah, if you want to elaborate on that. I mean, I, th I think everything I was talking about starting from my childhood was all, that was all the mud, you know, that I, that yeah. I went through that I, I was in. And then that, that all of that leading up to, you know, that moment that I was talking about that moment that I kind of like realized, oh my God, 
you know, I'm dating my uncles. Oh my God, these have been my tendencies. Like that, I feel like that's that was the flower finally getting to the light mm -hmm. and like awakening to 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 the past and like ju and just really then. But then also, I wouldn't be there without it, you know. So like right. I I I had I had to go through that or else I wouldn't be who I am and I love who I am. And so there's a really there's really a sense of gratitude. Um, for things that are very painful, but without, you know, there's like, there's people that suffer the most can become the happiest, you know, there's yes. light and darkness, pain and love, there's an other side to everything. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to experience one side to then be able to experience the other side. So at right. the end of the day, I'm, I wouldn't have wanted my life to go any other way because now I have, you know, I'm getting married this summer. I have three beautiful children. Without what happened to me, I would have never even come to America. And also this mm -hmm. mission that I have around, you know, I've been able to help a lot of people that were sexually abused to really just be vulnerable with them. And that's another big mission I have as a storyteller, too, is just um, straight men, gay men, you know, like any or also just any human being to really like allow allow your vulnerability. Like we spend all all our lives and all our days with our hearts closed because we're so scared of getting hurt. But our hearts is real, are really what connect us to each other. And I think being sensitive and caring is really a superpower that we need nowadays. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I know that we obviously met through, uh, not obviously, but we met through our Buddhist practice. Um, and I yeah. do find that, um, you know, the, the, idea of transforming karma, right. Or, you know, poison into medicine, uh, is you're like the living example of that, you know, by everything that you just shared and trying to find, uh, your mission through all that struggle, right. And then helping other people and really kind of recognizing the Buddha nature in every single person, right. That it's not something that even the person that you may hate the most, right. Like for instance, let's say it's your uncle, you know, who caused all this harm to you. It's kind of like, if I can, fathom the idea that he also is the Buddha, you know, deep down, but is obviously in a lot of pain. It's kind of like, you know, you are able to become more happy yourself, but also help others to do the same. And so, yeah, you've really kind of shown that through, through the work that you're doing and yeah, the, the beautiful life that you have created, you know, this Lotus Blossom life, like you said, with, you know, your soon to be husband, which is so exciting and uh, your three amazing sons. Is there something that you consider to be a personal achievement uh, that you really cherish, but maybe you're not necessarily so well known for? That I'm not that well known for. Um, <laughs> you're like, everything is out there. Okay. Share everything. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I share it, but I, I think just like my, this, this sense of being, being able to be victorious, um, the sense of like knowing that I'm connected to the universe and everything's in rhythm, knowing that everything is going to be okay is to me is a, is a, is a, is a huge achievement because I'm really able to just embrace life for what it is with all its, you know, ups and downs and messiness. And really seeing, really, not seeing obstacles, but seeing opportunities for growth. Mm. Um, so I'm really, really, the, my perception that I have is a, is a very big achievement for me. Amazing. Yes. Uh, so kind of to piggyback on that, what is your greatest weakness? Uh, but when you see this weakness kind of arise, <laughs> how do you kind of take, uh, how do you overcome it in the moment and not be kind of swayed by it when it, when you see this happening? Okay. So my two biggest weaknesses are one is people pleasing, mm -hmm. which I have been working on transforming. And I think I'm in a really good place with it. Now I tend to want to, because of what I've been through, you know, like I'm like, I, re I really care and want to help everyone, but there's only so much I can do. It's not, it's not my job to fix or save or help someone mm -hmm. um, to that degree. Like I can be, I can listen and be there for someone and give advice if it's needed, but I do not need to take on, you know, someone else's entire life as my own and become right. consumed by it. But uh, there's also, there's a beauty to it where I am with it now because I, I don't feel so guilty if I'm not, um, you know, like trying to, trying to save someone. I'm in a place now where I have boundaries but I'm also able to still really, you know, lis listen to someone's life with my heart. And sometimes it's just that sometimes someone just needs to be listened to some, you know, like just really like 
tuning into someone else's life and um, meeting them where they're at and learning their language mm -hmm. versus kind of like giving problem solving, which is not always what people want. Um, another weakness of mine is um, I can be critical, um, which I have been trying to transform with having appreciation versus mm. um, versus criticizing and right. um, which, which which is, I feel like criticism is kind of like an, an anger response almost. But now I've, I've been, I, I'm able to catch myself in that and really, again, see someone's life for what it is and appreciate that. Li like having, having appreciation instead of expectations, if that makes sense. Yes. Like appreciating yes, yes. someone for who they are versus an expectation of who they should be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I think it was Oprah that said, you know, the the way to kind of overcome uh, these difficult things that you see in people is to not judge them and expect them to react the way that you expect them to react, but rather to just accept them for who they are and react in a way that is best fitting, right, for you to be able to move forward. And I mean, I thank you for sharing that. I 100% agree, and I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. I'm extremely critical of myself, but I'm also uh, definitely trying to be a people pleaser recognizing that quickly right or period and then kind of trying to to change it is kind of what matters which is anything we practice we become good at so once you like you've realized this tendency that isn't suiting you or serving you and then you you start replacing because it's not you don't the tendency doesn't just go away you have to replace it with something so right. once you replace that tendency with you know with something that is more value creating more appreciative which it all really comes back to empathy really stepping out of my ego and really being with that person without judgment and you know really really just seeing them for who they are and where they're at someone's watching live on <laughs> on youtube which is great so i just wanted to respond to him uh he says uh oh. love you chris uh what did it say i'm glad Oh, to be here and listen to you today, which is awesome. So thank you, Lucas, for listening. Has there been a I made it kind of moment in your career thus far uh, as an actor? Um, yes. Uh, so I've been studying at a place called The Imagined Life with Diana Castle mm -hmm. the last two and a half years. And she has transformed my artistry and my heart on a level that I ne never even thought was possible. And mm -hmm. where I'm at now with my art and my daily creative practice you know of working on plays and really just uh, and really just like living in someone else's shoe well they're my shoes but you know like really like <laughs> yes. taking a play as a different framework and a different place in me J just being having been able to do that the last two and a half years and i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna study with her as as long as she teaches um but also since i've been studying there i've had my you know major breakthroughs i signed with brave artist management i I booked um, the lead in a short film. I just recently shot a short film. I last year got pinned for the pilot. I got called in twice for the lead of a show. Um, I booked Amazing. a show on Apple Plus that I'm not allowed to say what it is yet. It should be coming out. Uh, yeah, I, I just feel, th and th those are kind of like the business side of the victories, but the true victory is really like being able to live from a place in story that I created, that is real to me, that is true to me. It's value mm -hmm. creating, but also it's it's you know it's holding up a mirror to the audience to really be able to understand how to do that and to empathize with a different place in me and incarnate that. And it's not it's not a method, you know. It's it's something. Know it's a shift of attention and awareness. You know, you every story in me is a different adventure and a different so a, and a different awareness. You know, this is my Christopher life and another story might be my Max life or my Peter life or my, my Joe life. Mm. And really like wow. being able to to dig deep in those places in me always ends up reflecting back at my Christopher life, you know, because like when without judgment, I dig into these places, I usually am reflected back on my life with, you know, something that happened to me that I, that, that I didn't even realize a lens that I see certain things through, but also to, mm. to make sure that whoever in the audience sees a certain story, sees themselves and is able to say thank you for, you know, for voicing that, you know, because sometimes we, that's why we go to movies to, is to be, to be someone else, you know, it's an empathic experience. It's mirror neuroning and it's, it's really, sometimes we don't know how to say things or they're unspoken or they're better left unsaid or, and, and sometimes it's just great to like have that kind of like collective experience because it's not, it's not my pain, it's our pain.
it's not my sadness, yes. it's our sadness. So it's a really like connecting, Diana, Diana calls it the em empathetic campfire, you know, is like really mm -hmm. what storytelling is. Wow. Yes. Thank you so much. I was actually, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted you to dive into the imagined life and kind of share about that. So perfect timing. So thank you. And that's incredible. Congratulations, seriously, on uh, all the, the projects that you have coming up and, and you have done so far, especially in such a short amount of time. You've been able to kind of, you know, revolutionize uh, the way that you're, you're acting and the way you kind of perceive it. Right. Um, like you said about storytelling and yeah. Incredible. What brings you the most happiness now versus when you first came to LA and kind of got into this whole business as a creative? Exactly what I was talking about, like being in the imagined life and having this, because I feel, I feel like acting is such a misunderstood art form sometimes because it really is an empathic art form where hmm. you're asked, you know, to, to, to have deliver a symphony by 5 PM tomorrow, but to, to work the way that I work now, is so liberating, but also it's like, I don't, I don't want to do anything else. Like, you know, like it's, it's so delicious to me mm -hmm. to sit down every day for one, two, three, four, five hours and, and to really imagine what it would be like, you know, to live, to live in the thirties and be a closeted homosexual, you know, or, or to, to live in the eighties and the rise of, you know, HIV and, and how is, and what is that like? You know, um, it's, it's, it's so, incredible how we're because like it's it's, a, it's almost like a time machine you know the the human invented the time machine when we invented movies to really just experience different states of life and to really just to really be curious and imagine and to to make and believe you know we all create the world we live in and that's exactly what storytelling is is you know like every story is a new construction to really to really um find the heart of it the core of it and we talk a lot about in class too, but is, is becoming unmoored, you know, leaving the safety of our own harbors and things that are familiar to us, that are known to us and really go out and, and you know, and, and really learn what it's like to be, you know, something else. Amazing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can hear the kids having a good old time. Uh, background. Yeah, they're playing, they're playing baseball. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Good for them. Enjoying. It's a beautiful day out. So good for them to do it. So, you know, I, I always like to ask kind of about work ethic. Like you, you kind of already tapped into this a little bit, but, you know, being a creative and doing, you know, the tasks, if you will, or the things that we have to do in order to get the work done is no easy feat. So, you know, what is your work ethic like? And also to kind of pair that with like, what is a day in the life like, uh, for Christopher Lamb? Yeah, no, to a work ethic is having a mission, right? Around it. You know, if, if you're doing something that isn't fulfilling you or it's not value creating for you and for others, then, you know, is that true? Because a lot of times we, we, we become this should be self. You know, what our parents think we should be, what our culture says we should be, what society says we should be, like to have a secure job and to, you know, to have a certain amount of income. So like we take on these parts of us that, that aren't us, you know, and that's kind of like where, where everyone starts developing a costume, you know, do doing what, what I do now is, is, is so much fun because I get to peek behind all these costumes. Um, but also just to have a mission around whatever you're doing in life, you know, to, to have a mission around, like it, it should really fill your spirit of where I'm like, well, this is why I'm doing it. Um, for me too, it's every day I have this, like, I must, you know, I must tell the story. I must, you know, like I must, you know, experience this heartbreak so that when I'm telling the story in the audience, you know, the person with their heart broken sees that and, you know, can say thank you. Um, mm. Also, yeah, that, that's what I do. I, so I basically, I get up in the morning, I usually take care of the kids. And mm. then depending on if I have any opportunities or if I have a, you know, a modeling casting or something that I, t I take care of those things. Um, but usually... A normal day would be take care of the kids, send them off to school, have breakfast. I come up and I, I do my, my chanting, my, my meditation. And then after that, I, I dive into whatever story is on my rotation. So that's like the mm -hmm. first thing I do in the day. So I, I, I work on my stories for class. And if I have an opportunity that my manager send me, then I, I usually do work on my story for class first. And then I dive into for the rest of the day into that other story. Um, if, if I have something from my managers, I'll have like an eight to 10 hour day that I, and I don't bring my phone upstairs. 
So it's mm. just, it's just me. It's uninhibited. And I can really just, you know, oh. focus on, focus on that story and, you know, f finding in the language who I am, you know, because that's what yeah. the language is all. It's a, it's all a container for, it's all a portal for an experience. The same, like when we talk to each other, you know, like if, if you, Alan, say, I love my mother, the words, I love my mother look nothing like the experience of you loving your mother. So that's like wow. my job every day is to ask of myself, like to create that with my five senses and to really have a experience to the point that it hits my heart. Like the lovely bones, wow. you know, when I watched that, that, that arrow shot through the fortress of ice. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. I think you're by far one of the, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of other people that are that dedicated to, you know, this mission that you're talking about as the work that you do, but yeah, just listening to you. And I know we've had many conversations and you've shared, you know, the kind of the process as well, but yeah, not a lot of people are willing to kind of do the work, if you will, or the, the, the showing up, right. The consistency of it. So, yeah. um, but, yeah. but it is, it's a, if you want, you can talk about swimming, but to be a good swimmer, you have to get on the water and swim. Right. So it's like, you can talk about it all you want, but you have to actually show up consistently. And then it's an accumulation of the daily work and the daily practice of keeping those neuro pathways open and keeping your heart open, you know, being susceptible to getting these emotional hits and, and right. to really, you know, be vulnerable and be accessible, you know, because then in the industry you're dealing with, you know, cameras and 40 people and, you know, d d is the word right and is it perfect, you know, but then when you're doing that, you're thinking like an actor. So your job mm -hmm. at home when you're doing vulnerability work is to really dive into, and this is all what Diana teaches, you know, like if anyone listens to this and wants to be a storyteller as a storyteller, highly recommend hitting up a introductory workshop because she is, every Monday is like a, a, a rocket ship for the soul, you know, when I have class with mm -hmm. her and every day at home too, to this, just this daily excavation and chiseling away, you know, um, like Michelangelo and David, you know, this chiseling away the circumstances that make me, me in this framework. Yes. I'm curious because, you know, you, you talked about, you know, some of the stories that you have kind of been able to tap into, right. As part of the, the work of like that of, you know, like gay men specifically. And, you know, as you said, uh, you are a gay man yourself with, you know, a family and everything. Uh, you know, Hollywood has come a long way, but let's be real. It's not that open at this point. Have you had any yeah. encounters or issues as an actor uh, going on auditions or doing projects and feeling as though either a, you get typecast because of, you know, um, you know, being a gay man, or do you feel like you're not given the roles uh, because you are a gay man that, you know, of a leading, um, leading male actor or something like that? Um, yeah. I'm just curious if that's ever kind of come across your, your desk, if you will. I'm, I mean, like you're saying, I think the pendulum is definitely swing, swinging, but collectively in America, you know, what we're seeing in politics and, and the, just in, in general, you know, there's a, there's a big uproar happening and there's a lot of work to do, but the pendulum is swinging. Um, right. And the old ways are dying, you know, by their, everyone's screaming and having tantrums because they're not getting their old ways. Um, yes. But we're definitely in a place where, you know, it's more inclusive um, the last two projects I did, I did play a closeted man in the fifties. So that was kind of my, my recent tagline is closeted in the fifties, but also I have a mission around <laughs> that. So I'm, I'm, I'm not mad about it at all. It's on, it's an honor, um, to me to be able to tell those stories. And it's still, it has nothing to do with my Christopher life, you know, like being gay is just one ingredient. It's just one circumstance. Right. It's still a completely different framework, but also there's things, you know, like the movie, my policeman, you know, like when they have a singer who doesn't have any acting training and isn't gay, they just like hand you a role and then, you know, and you watch it and you, it's like watching paint dry, you know, it's because you don't know what you're, you need to ask yourself to make it symphonic or to make it colorful, you know, and to, yeah. to really experience, you know, being a, being a human is so contradictory and, and complex. Um, but when you show up, when you show up and you're playing, then it's a child's game, you know, then it's, I'm, we're playing cops and robbers. Mm -hmm. you know but in this case you know it's a different story you know yeah i think at the heart of what you're saying is that uh playing a character is really based on the depth of you as an actor right telling the story place in me that's playing it's not a character you know it's a place in me right that's playing right. um 
But also like back to your question, I do sometimes have those things in my head. Like two weeks ago, I read for a feature film, you know, where I played a straight guy and, and I had things in my head being like, Oh, what if they look at my Instagram and see that I'm gay? Like, well, mm -hmm. will that cost me the job? Um, right. or what, you know, in the short film that I just shot too, um, you know, there's, there's four actors were all playing gay men, but I was the only actual gay man, but I was still fine with that. We all had fun. And, you know, you're an actor, you know, so you're supposed to be able to, um, excavate a place in you that's unfamiliar, you know? So like it's the same for straight people playing gay and gay people playing straight. Of course, it'd be nice to get a foot in the door, but that happens after you consistently show up. And if you don't give up, you know, it'll, it'll happen one day. You know, there's so many incredible actors that were at a, like, look at Billy Porter, you know, like he stayed true to who he is as a gay man and as an artist for 30 years, almost 40 years until he had his breakthrough, you know, with part with pose. Um, so yeah. um, it's another concept. It's like, as long as you stay true to yourself, um, it'll, it'll happen, you know, and then that's why it's important to have a daily creative practice. So you don't get swayed by the business um, and the thoughts and the, the actor concerns, because if that takes over, then you're an actor acting and not a human being living. Um, right. And I, I did have one negative experience with a commercial agent where she wanted to rep me, but was like, but told my friend who she already reps that she was like, he looks straight, but you told me he's gay. Like, does he sound gay? Because if he sounds gay, that's going to be a problem. You know, and then I, I ended up not taking the meeting with her because I was like, I like, you know, that like, I don't, I don't want to work with you if, if, right. if that you, have, that's you haven't even met yeah. me, that's what you're saying, you know, so, so there are aspects to it, but also like this pendulum swinging right now is a great thing. And I think it is, um, a lot of doors are being kicked down, you know, for, for so many um, for the whole range, you know, of, of people, people of color, of, you know, of um, the, the gender binary. And, and just, I, I, th I think there's a big, big shift happening because I think authenticity is what we crave the most nowadays with so much, you know, advertisement and just like, just disingenuine and fake stuff. Like, I think we're really craving to really see who we really are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, full representation, I think, on television and, and film is necessary. And yeah, I do agree with you. I think that the pendulum is really swinging uh, and kind of going more towards that, which is great. To your point about Billy Porter, actually, I think he said in an interview as well, you know, that it was actually for so long in his career, he was actually trying to play a less, uh, like a toned down version of himself. But it wasn't until these later years where he really recognized that, like, I have to be a, a truly authentically myself, right? And then, yes, that role in, you know, in Pose kind of gave him this platform to really rise up and show who he really was. So yeah, I think the, the sooner you're able to kind of stay true to yourself, you know, and not put on airs just to get the, the work that you think you need, uh, the universe does respond, you know, in a, in a really kind of magnificent way. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. no, I appreciate you, uh, sharing about that. What is one thing that you've learned about yourself by being in this acting and modeling worlds that you didn't really know prior to? Oh, that's a, a great. Um, and I think it ties back into what I've been talking about is like when I first showed up into LA, I was wearing a costume of, of someone who I'm not mm, to yeah. get the product to please to, and then the last three years has finally been a kind of like finding my true self, but also accepting my true self and also finding the, the gift in my true self. And, um, embracing it and knowing that 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 is my superpower you know mm. not not this 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 version that i think is gonna get you know the job or this version that i think people is what people want to see based on you know right. cultural views or or what's gonna sell yeah well and i mean just being gay and young in la is like <laughs> is is a shell unto itself you know i think that it is kind of you know uh expected not expected but kind yeah, of it's just kind all, of we're all just yearning yearning for community yearning right. for love but then it takes so many different shapes because we're we're trying to you know trying to to please those yearnings in a different way by looking for our happiness outside of ourselves. You know, like so many people do, they come to town and they look for their happiness and in, in sex and in drugs and in parties, you know, 
um, yes. because they think that that's that's gonna make this is gonna make me feel good and this is I'm gonna you know but it's 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 not because you're you're looking outside of yourself and you'll never find the answer outside of yourself. Completely true. Can't find your happiness outside of yourself. It starts with you and ends with you. I'm curious, who has kind of been your greatest supporter or fan through this whole process and, and journey that you've been going through? I would say that my parents have been very supportive, even though they live in Germany, that they, when I said I'm leaving the military, I'm moving to LA and I'm doing this, you know, they, they definitely um, supported me this whole time and they've cheered me on this whole time. And, you know, they've, They've always, they've never told me like, give up, or this is not for you. You know, they've always encouraged me to, to keep going, to keep fighting. And, and that, that, that feels really good. And then now Dan and the kids, of course, too, you know, I have a really good, they're all very supportive too, which um, is a great feeling. And then my community that I have at the Imagine Life and Diana Castle, that too, I just feel, I feel very grateful for, for everyone's love and support. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think community and family are so crucial to have because of the struggles that are included <laughs> in this career if, or this mission, as you said, um, you know, as artists. And so, yeah, to have someone that really is there to support, you know, kind of gives you the fuel at times when you're low, you know, to kind of keep moving forward. So, yeah, that's amazing that you have so many people that are really supportive of you. What is uh, uh, COVID-19 rather? What was that process like for you? Uh, kind of because I think you said, right, you, you started the Imagine Life during COVID, it seems like in the last two and a half years. Um, and we've mm -hmm. been in this crazy pandemic for way too long, but now we're finally kind of coming out of it in 2023. But yeah, can you kind of elaborate on, you know, what was that whole process like for you as a creative and, you know, what kind of kept you going to today? Yeah. I mean, the pandemic is, it's kind of still going. I feel like we're just kind of like at the point where a lot of people are just putting their head in the sand and just saying like, if I'm not affected, then, you know, uh, then who cares because like well, who really is suffering right now is the elderly community by everyone kind of you know like by you know it's that that myth of cassandra um from the trojan horse i don't know if you're familiar with it but cassandra comes running and she warns everyone about mm. you know what's about to happen and everyone's just like she's crazy and i'm not gonna listen to her because i'm not affected um which is you know what happened with covid what happened with hiv you know, it's, it's these people saying like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not part of this certain group. So, you know, fight for your life. Um, mm. but yeah, and the, and Dan, Dan is a lung cancer surgeon. So he, he's, um, always been able to shed a lot of light on, um, what's going on, especially the immunocompromised, um, groups. Right. Anyways, um, Dan and I met in January, 2020. Wow. So it kind of like, yeah, so we met in January 2020, and then it kind of like, then the pandemic happened, he had to work, the kids had to stay at home, and that was kind of a place where I had to make a decision to, to like, I love him, I love the kids, and I'm either going to commit to this or not, you know, and I think that a lot of things in life are about truly committing, you know, um, the same with, you know, with my mission as a storyteller is to really have that daily commitment that I, you know, apply to my work, but also this commitment that I had to Dan and the kids, and then... Um, basically um, a lot a lot of great things came out of that commitment i was i was staying home with the kids taking care of them i mean it was a very mm -hmm. uncertain time as everyone knows and then the first year i was kind of i was studying at a different place and i was also just kind of like adapting to this new change and then yeah, in 2020 in february 2021 is when i started studying at the imagined life um which okay. was Great. But then that too is just like, how, how do we all stay safe, but how do we still, you know, stay connected and have a life? So I think it was a big challenge for a lot of people. Um, of course, we're, we're fortunate to have had a, a, you know, a nice house to stay at, to have had each other. I know that a lot of people were very lonely and there is also not just with the pandemic, but there's a big loneliness um, epidemic happening. I think too. Um, so like, I definitely felt for those people and made sure I was staying in touch with friends and checking in on people. And, um, when we were allowed to kind of like meet in a certain way outdoors, like with distance or with masks, like, um, if it was safe, like we did, you know, do those kind of things. But yeah. And for, for Dan, you know, he, as a doctor, it was definitely a stressful time, 
but also there were times where he he um, got to work from home when he didn't have surgery days. So um, there was also good things about that because he got to spend work working from home, but also spending time with the family was nice mm-hmm. for him. And that shift now continued. And so now he, he operates on Mondays and Fridays. On Tuesdays, he sees patients in the hospital, but Wednesday and Thursdays, he consistently works from home now. So, mm-hmm. so there, you know, there were, there were, there were, it was a, another thing of like, how do we create value out of this and, and stay safe and like make sure that other people, because it was, it was about us, but also about the safety of others. Like I was saying, like people that are immunocompromised or at a certain age, age group, um, that, that those people, because a lot of people did die, you know? Yes. A lot of people died. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's major. I'm actually curious and you don't have to go, you can go as deeply into this or as, as little as you want, but you know, because you guys met during like before COVID started, but literally that short, like, what is it, what was it like to build your relationship during a a global pandemic that's going on in the midst of, as you shared, you know, his busy schedule, he has three kids that are now your kids as well, you know, and building this family, it seems like on top of everything else that you're trying to do for yourself, you know, as you know, the storyteller and creative, I'm just curious, kind of how do you manage to build a really strong relationship with someone when, you know, everything else is kind of nuts for lack of a better term kind of going on around you? Well, I think it goes back to like I was saying about commitment, mm-hmm. about saying I'm committed to him, I'm committed to the kids, and that commitment, of course, it's not just the literal commitment. You know, it's the commitment to their emotional life and and the commitment to you know making sure they're taken care of, and um, and I think from all those sincere efforts of love is you know where where this kind of like new new garden then blossoms you know that's all our relationships i always look at them as gardens and it mm. takes two people to water them so um it was it was a, it was a great and healthy experience it definitely transformed like the relationships i used to choose um right. that i was talking about at the beginning of of the podcast and where I, and when i first met dante i was like this is so healthy and like why are <laughs> why is the roof why is the roof not caving in you know and it's right. because my body was so familiar to abuse and you mm-hmm. know like not being valued or appreciated that when right. then my body was just like what is this you know i don't i don't i don't know this like this is like run you know but then i was like i was at a place where i feel so much where i'm like no like this is exactly what i've been working towards and this is really a gift to now wow. commit to this new this new, like I was talking about earlier too, like transforming our tendencies, um, to now say, no, this is, this is who I am now as Christopher. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not this old self anymore. So Hmm. yeah, uh, commitment. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people lack commitment nowadays, especially with being so disconnected with our phones and devices. And there's a big disconnect, I think, in in humanity, even though, even though we are, we we now have the potential to be so connected with being able to, you know, um, with Instagram and with the news and constantly being tapped into everything. Like it's a, like the butterfly effect, you know, like something happens in Asia and it affects us here. Um, cause I do, you know, we're all interconnected. Um, but then there is like this, we, and I, I, I see it with our oldest son, you know, like I love him, um, so much, but it's, it's this, this thing of like, being on your phone and on the computer, you know, it's a, it's like the opposite of grounding now is being like you actually have to leave your room and hang out with us or people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I hope That's... he doesn't watch because he will be so mad I said that. <laughs> Don't send him the link. No, I mean I I hundred percent agree with you. I think that yeah, you you literally have transformed, right? You bloomed into this lotus with this relationship and this family that you've created, and yeah, seeing the things that you kind of would maybe necessarily repeat, right? In prior, you know, circumstances is kind of really uh, transformed. So that's such a beautiful story, but also, yeah, life to live. I mean, that's really what, you know, we, I think are seeking, right? Is to, to find that uh, sense of family and, you know, kind of transform the relationships that we um, are in with others. So thank you so much for opening up about that. Um, I'm curious, uh, just a few more questions here, but uh, what are maybe looking to the future? What are some goals that you have set for yourself in the next three to five, even 10 years from now? Um, yeah, just kind of curious what uh, Christopher Lamb will be doing. 
Yes, um, I'm going to continue to be committed to, to my, my, um, you know, my career as a storyteller. Um, I'd love in the next three to five years, like I said, I have something coming out on Apple Plus where I'm on one episode, but it feels like I have a foot in the door. And also with all the wins I had last year, like I definitely see myself in the next three to five years, um, you know, getting that serious regular or, you know, yeah. just, just working, working more, but also um, aligning with stories that align with um, my mission as a storyteller. And then also to continue, I mean, our oldest is going to college next year. Um, Ari, who's 14, is going to high school next year, you know, like to just to continue fostering um, the harmony and the love, you know, that we built here and to, 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 to champion our kids and my friends and my community and to just continue deepening my life, my faith, my, my, my Buddhist practice, my, my imagined life practice. I'm really, I'm really grateful that I get to do that. So that's, that's mm. what I'm going to be doing. Amazing. I love that. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'd like to ask this question and it's kind of weird, but if you could write or say something rather to your future self, uh, 15 years from now, almost like a message in a bottle, uh, to the future, um, what would you say to that future Christopher and, um, whether that's something inspirational or congratulations, however you want to phrase it. Um, it's definitely a congratulations. Um, I, th I think it's more of a, like, I'm, I'm proud of you for never giving up mm. kind of like in that, in that realm. Also maybe a thank you letter to myself, to the future self. It's a, a, a thank you letter for, you know, all the, all the causes I've made and all the, all the, um, actions I've taken to, to, to lead the life that I have now, but also that I know is, um, waiting ahead. Wow. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Is there a motto or phrase that you live by something that you consistently kind of turn to on a daily or weekly or whenever, but something that you really feel is kind of embodies who you are? Yes. Um, I think it's, um, I have a Phoenix tattoo on my arm, so it's kind of like this every, every day, you know, I get to create my reality. I get to create value. I get to, um, and also that's why I say the word get, you know, because there's so many people in the world and different countries that, you know, don't get to be openly, um, open about their sexuality or people that are, yeah. you know, being oppressed in different parts of the world. Um, or people in the Ukraine, you know, that are in a war zone, you know, it's like, I, I get to wake up and I get to fight for my dreams. Right. So, um, I don't know if that's too long of an answer, but I live, I live by that, the, the, just the appreciation for the gift of life and like the treasures that I have within that I, I want, want to also reflect back to the world yeah, and to make sure yeah. that I make sure that that's done. Yes. Yeah. Is the, is the Phoenix on your arm? Um, I'm like stuck here. I'm like, I can't even move my arm. <laughs> my arm's asleep. No kidding. Um, is the Phoenix kind of like the Phoenix rising from the ashes? Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, wow. That's, that's really cool. That almost looks tribal. Is that the, the design? Yeah. Um, when I was in the air force, a friend of mine, um, he's Polynesian and he, he kind of mm. helped me design everything, but it's, it's a Phoenix. It's a, it's a German Eagle that I had drawn to look like a Phoenix. So it reminds me of where I'm from. <laughs> Nice. Um, so when I was in the military, I was like, I never want to forget where I'm from, but also like with everything that I've experienced in my life that my past doesn't define me, but like every day I get to rise, you know, every day I get to rise. Um, and with that, like that, that feeling too, of like really like rising with the wings and like the fire and, um, to really, to really be able to, to really claim, claim my, my inner Phoenix, my inner power every day. Amazing. So beautifully said. Well, that actually uh, wraps it up really much. I just always like to ask, uh, where can people follow you? Uh, and also like on social media, but also uh, if you have a website, links that they can uh, find you for the work that you've done. Uh, I always like to ask each guest to share that. And of course, I'll you know put out the links down below in the description and the show notes. But um, yeah, I would love to know where can they follow you? Yeah. So I only have Instagram and my name ah. on there is Christopher Lamb. L A M okay. and you know, that's it. I try to limit my social media use. So I got rid of my Facebook, I think seven or seven years ago or something like that. And then got it. Like, like I said, like, I like to, I like to 
phones are great, but I try, I try to, I feel like it messes with our focus. So, and what I need to do for work is very focus driven. So I try to, um, I, I, I like, I, it has great things and I like using it, but I also try to, you know, have a healthy boundary. But yeah, yeah Instagram, totally. Christopher Lamb, LA. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Keep it simple. Although it's funny, I was on Facebook posting about this and I did search like your name and I think there's like, it looks like a fraudulent account or something, but it literally hadn't been posted since, uh, I think like 2018 or something. And it was like random photos. Um, or maybe it's your old account that just kind of still lingering there. I don't I know. It, I think it, my old account should be from like 2016 or okay. 15, maybe Got 16, it. 15. I don't know. May, I, mean, I don't know. But I mean, people, people are weird, you know, people do. People yes. do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're also, your, your name is getting out there. So the fact that, you know, as not only a model, but also as an actor, right. You're kind of like, yeah, it's people. Yeah. People get weirder when you're more well-known, I guess is the best way to put it. So yeah, hopefully it's, it's not a, a real account and, uh, or hopefully, yeah. Anyways. Um, awesome. Well, thank you. That was an awkward ending to this, but thank you so much, Christopher, for all of your time. And I said, maybe send me that afterwards so I can verify. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'll send you, I'll send you the weird, weird Facebook post. That's not you. So yes. Okay. Um, awesome. Well, thank you much. I can't wait to see everything you have coming out and, um, yeah, look forward to, uh, yeah, being able to see you on the big screen and also on, uh, this, my screen on Apple TV plus hopefully very soon. So, uh, yeah, thank yeah. you again. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this week's episode of the creative Lotus podcast. And a huge thank you to Christopher for all of his amazing stories and being so vulnerable and opening his heart to us. This week's Buddhist quote of the week is the voice is alive. That is what gives it the power to move and stir others. The feeling in a voice enters through the ears, the gateway to the spirit, travels deep into the heart, rousing it and stimulating a reaction which manifests as action by Daisaku Ikeda. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Go ahead and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching here on YouTube, go ahead and hit that big old thumbs up button. It really does help out with the algorithm. And if you want to go ahead and check out a full episode, click right there. And until then, I will say see ya and have a wonderful week. I'll see you in the next episode. What is up, Creative Lotus family? Thank you so much for supporting the Creative Lotus podcast. Go ahead and follow us on social media. On Facebook, we're at the Creative Lotus podcast. Here on YouTube, maybe you're watching, we're at the Creative Lotus podcast as well. And on Instagram, we're at the Creative Lotus pod. And my personal handle is at Alan Zaki. We say thank you once again. Go ahead and subscribe, listen, write a review. And until the next episode, we'll see you there. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. Bye-bye.